and talking about basic things about you know tensors, low rank, uh, tensor rank, border rank, and approximation. So let's get going. Okay, so uh, the setting is the following. We have a couple of vector spaces, V1 up to Vp. Um, vector spaces over a field K. And the dimension of Vi is Ni. So we'll be uh, looking at the tensor product of these vector spaces, V1, tensor V2, all the way up to Vp, which is a large vector space of dimension N1 times N2 all the way up to Np. And, uh, now this is sort of a mathematical way of looking at, uh, at tensors, but, uh, but if you like, there's also, a, say, a coordinate-based way of looking at tensors, which, which is that the elements of this uh, vector space are just p-way uh, arrays of numbers with sides n1 times n2 all the way up to np. Now, by definition of a tensor product, every tensor is a, is a sum of uh, pure tensors, uh, tensors of the form Vi1, tensor Vi2, up to Vip, and uh, so every, every tensor is of that form for some number k up here. Now that expression is not minimal, uh, not, not unique, which is to, to a large extent why we are here today, and uh, the minimal k in any such expression is called the rank of that tensor u. Now, the tensor rank is a, is a somewhat ill-behaved notion. Uh, for instance, it, uh, it may depend on the field. So if you, if you enlarge your field, if you tensor all these vector spaces with a field extension of k, then the tensor rank can go down. And also, being of, of, of rank at most some number is not a closed condition. In fact, for both of these, there's a nice example that uh, like Heng Lim and uh, Vin de Silva described, which is that if you look at uh, u in if you look at u in R two tensor R two tensor R two, then uh, on this space there is a, a nice invariant called the uh, hyperdeterminant, Cayley's hyperdeterminant. And, uh, and there are three cases, namely delta of u is negative, then, uh, then the rank of, uh, of the real numbers of u is equal to 3, while the rank of the, of the complex numbers of u is equal to 2. And uh, delta u is positive, in which case the rank, I guess, is the same namely 2, and then it might also be 0, and then it's, uh, many things or several different things can happen, but, but one of the things can, that can happen, and that's in fact the general, the generic case, uh, is that the rank over the real numbers of u is the rank of the complex numbers of u is equal to 3. So you see over here that the uh, that the rank can drop when you extend the field. And here you see that it can happen that, that tensors that have rank 3, namely with delta equal to 0, can be arbitrarily well approximated by things that have rank 2, namely with positive delta. So that's the non-closedness of that condition. OK, so the border rank takes, takes away those two problems. Um, Namely, it's the minimal case such that u lies in the Zariski closure of the set of all tensors of rank at most k. And uh, when I say that takes care of those two problems, I'm assuming that k is an infinite field. If k is finite, then sort of the border rank is the same as the rank uh, if you define it this way, and it's, it's an un, uh, interesting uh, notion. Okay. Now, the reason why it would be interesting to, to approximate arbitrary tensors by low rank tensors is that they form a, a lower dimensional variety. So the tensors of border rank at most k, they form a variety of dimension at most k times, so k is for the number of terms in here, uh, uh, the dimension that you need to, the, the number of uh, 
say, coordinates that you need to describe such a tensor. And that, that's the sum for i is 1 up to p of ni minus 1 plus 1. Basically, because each of these is from an ni dimensional vector space, where I guess I should say nj because i means something else here. Um, but you can move scalars in front, so that accounts for the minus 1 here and the 1 over here. Now, in particular, if k is very small, then this is, of course, a number that's much smaller than n1 times n2 all the way up to np. So, so you might want to try to uh, check whether tensors have, have low rank or try to approximate tensors by things of low rank. OK, so what do we mean by approximating? OK, um, so in the rest of the talk, I'll be talking exclusively about real numbers and complex numbers. Um, so. For now, k is the real numbers, and each vi is equ equipped with a, uh, a positive definite inner product. And we give v the inner product that is determined by this expression. If you take the inner product of two pure tensors, two rank one tensors, then that is the product for i is 1 up to p of the inner products of these guys. It's easy to see that there's a unique such inner product. and. Uh, and that's, in some sense, the, the, the most natural type of inner product to equip this, uh, this vector space V with. OK, so now you might wonder, given a tensor in V and given a natural number K, uh, how do we find a X in V of rank at most K that minimizes the, the square distance to, uh, uh, to the given tensor U? So many people, also from applications, people like Lief and De Lathauer have, have studied this problem and sort of gave, uh, given local or heuristic optimization algorithms for trying to, to find that minimum. Um, Does this minimum depend on your choice of inner product? I mean this inner product that I've, yeah, that I've but fixed. Yeah, suppose it. I change the inner product. Of course it will change, then this minimum. Oh, what you, the, yeah, the, yeah, the best approximation will change. Yes. So. Um, yeah, let me... I mean, cer certainly that's going to be true when, when I take an arbitrary inner product on V. If it comes from inner products on the VI, no, I, I then, mean, when then it comes, let, yeah, let's okay. take a reasonable inner product. So when it comes from inner yeah. products on the VIs, that was really the question I meant to ask. That, okay, I see. Um, I'm not sure. Let me get back to that maybe. Okay. The value of D would be different. But yeah, yeah. So certainly the value will the, might be the, different, but but the the x the the, 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 the optimizer the, x, the minimizer the yeah no oh, that's a good point um, let me think about it and then get back to it um, okay so um, so I was saying so so people study this problem and have various type of heuristic algorithms. And one of the problems with such al algorithms is that, uh, that they might get stuck in local minima. And that sort of m motivated us to, to study the following problem, namely given a tensor, try to ca count the number of critical points of, of this uh, function on the, uh, the smooth part of this set, whatever that means. Okay, so it's a set of tensors of rank at most k. And now I'll make my life completely easy and even then, there are interesting things to say. Namely, I'll, I'll study entirely. I mean, for most of this talk, I'll say only things about k is equal to 1. And sorry to ask the same yeah. question again, but yeah. at least for this related problem, can you prove that that's independent of the reasonable choice of inner product, the number of critical points? Y yes, yes. So this number of critical points is going to be independent that's of the choice of the, of the reasonable inner product. That's right. Yeah. And yeah, maybe for your question, I mean, it, I think it does depend, I mean, not for rank one, but for rank two already. And you can see it already for matrices, right? Already for two factors, because the two factors, the minimum rank decomposition will just um, that's right, yeah. Will just be, Thanks. Just, yeah, be singular vectors, and they are mm -hmm. orthogonal, okay. but with respect to the inner product, so yeah. that, but they will not be orthogonal. Yeah, so very good point. Yeah. And why do you want to count? I thought you would want to find those critical points. 
That, that is right. Uh, that we, we, that's what we really like. So, well, there are two answers to that. One is, uh, so I'll be saying mostly things about the real numbers, and, and this, at least this count, gives some sort of measure of complexity for these heuristic algorithms that might run into local minima. Um, another thing is, if you, if you count them over the complex numbers, and you generate, all, uh, I mean, the most naive algorithm for trying to find this minimizer is enumerating all critical points. And if you can count them, then you know when you are done. I'm not claiming that this is an efficient algorithm for finding the minimum. OK, so, uh, so here's uh, indeed matrices. So thanks. Um, OK, so we'll, we'll study the set X, which is the set of uh, rank at most, uh, in fact, rank one tensors. It's, um, it's a smooth manifold of uh, also called pure tensors. And what we want is given a tensor, count the critical points of du on that uh, smooth manifold x. Now, there's an important observation, which is that if you fix those inner products, then, then this, this question here is, uh, doesn't change when you, uh, when you act with an element of the product of the orthogonal groups. Right? Simply because this product of the orthogonal groups preserves both x and the, the, the inner product that we're studying. Um, so, so here's the very basic case that was already alluded to. Namely, if p is equal to 2, then two-way tensors are just matrices. And then there, there is the, uh, if you want, the, uh, a special case of the eckhart jung theorem, which tells you what, what the answer is to this question. Namely... Um, given any tensor u, there are elements g1 and g2 in the orthogonal groups of v1 and v2, such that if you apply their tensor product or their, uh, to, to, uh, to u, then you're going to get a tensor in normal form, which means it's a sum for i is 1 up to the minimum of n1 and n2, which is n1 of ci times ei tensor fi, where, where these are orthonormal and these are orthonormal. And, uh, uh, and moreover, you can uh, arrange it such that all these numbers ci's are uh, decreasing and that are uh, non-negative. And then they're known as the singular values. And well, if you have a tensor of this form, it's a very simple computation to, to find out what the um, what, what the critical points of the distance function are. Namely, they are just, for each i from 1 up to n1, they are just ci times ei tensor fi. So since this problem is invariant under this group, you get the critical points for the original u by applying g1 inverse, g2 inverse to that. And indeed, uh, if you change your uh, inner product, this decomposition might change. Uh, so actually, I think there's a... You know, Eckert Young theorem is, you know, has been extended by Mirsky. It's Eckert Young Mirsky's theorem. And what he shows is that uh, regardless of your choice, as long as it's invariant under this action, mm -hmm. it's always given by the singular value decomposition. The X doesn't depend on the choice law. In fact, for matrices, it doesn't. That, you know, that's approximation X. You mean if you, if you choose any inner product on yes. V that is invariant under this product of groups, then it's... In fact, it's, it doesn't even I see. come from inner product. I see. Any on that's invariant under this action. Okay. Yeah. Um. Sorry, can, you, can you say that again? Yeah, so if you look at the previous slide, uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So this norm here, right? Of yeah. course, in, in, in this case, it comes from an inner product. But any norm that is invariant under that uh, OV1, V2. Oh, okay. But yeah. it's still it would the be, same. Yeah, it would always be. The best solution would always be. Always the same axis. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. If you fix it, the orthogonal group is so essentially. Yeah. That's right. In a sense, yeah. you fix everything that you need yeah. to prove that theory. Yeah. But, 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 but it's a good point. Uh, why is it greater than zero? Um, so they're not eigenvalues, right? They're, or they are eigenvalues of, of a positive definite matrix that you get by <coughs> something times it's transpose. Yeah. Assume that it's positive. No, no, no. You're, you're not finding eigenvalues of a. You're finding eigenvalues of a transpose a. Exactly. So you can absorb the phases into the EI if you like. Well, the like. That's right. If 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 the. Uh, 
I mean, if, if, if one is negative, then you multiply the EI with uh, minus. OK, so that's rank, rank one approximation for matrices. Um, now, for ordinary tensors, here's a fact that, that is that this number of critical points is typically not, not constant. Uh, it's going to j jump across some hypersurface, of which I have, unfortunately, very little to say. Um, so, so the question over the real numbers that I posed doesn't make sense. There is no n single number that, to, to compute. So what we do is we're going to compute an average. So what we, we are going to draw u from a probability distribution and then compute the average number of critical points that you get in this way. Okay, so, so here's the theorem. Namely, if you draw u uniformly from the unit sphere in, the, in V with respect to this uh, inner product that I defined, um, then, uh, then the expected number of critical points of, uh, of this distance function to u is this expression. Okay, so what's important about this expression? Well, there are things that you recognize from, I don't know, volumes of spheres and other things, and uh, Gaussian. Uh, distributions, there's a 2 pi to some power, there's some gammas, and there's a, uh, a, bold, a math bold-faced E with uh, an absolute value of a determinant. So what's that? Well, this C itself is going to be a random matrix, of which I'll describe the structure in detail on the, on the next slide, and this E is the expected value of the absolute value of the determinant of that random matrix. There's some uh, Notation, so n is the sum of the ni's, and p is the number of factors that we had before. Um, and c, so w another thing that's important about this expression is that c is not a very large matrix, but, but in fact a rather small matrix. It's, so it's roughly the sum of the ni's times the sum of the ni's, except that you subtract p from each. So can you give us an idea of, let's say we fix, fix p equal to 3 even, and let the n's grow. Uh, what does this function grow like? Um, I, I don't understand. Uh, maybe it's too early in the morning for me to do this kind of thing in my head. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give some numbers later on. Oh, okay. um, actually, no, yeah, not, for, not so much for fixed p and uh, running n. Well, let me, let me give some numbers later. We, we, we haven't actually figured out exactly uh, the, the asymptotics of this uh, of this expected value of the determinant. Does it does it is it increasing or decreasing even? It looks like it's if you fix p. I'll 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 get back to that too. Okay. <laughs> there, there will be numbers. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, actually, what's interesting <coughs> is uh, I think it might be the case where where you where you let fix the ends and let the p run. Because then, then this is a problem that looks similar to what people in random matrix theory do. So then this, this uh, matrix C looks very similar to, say, standard <coughs> Gaussian ensembles that people study. So then it might be possible to say any, uh, something about the asymptotics, but we have not yet done so. Okay, so, so, so what's important about this formula is... Um, is that so? Suppose that you would want to compute this expected number of critical points in a straightforward manner. Well, then you would have to sample u from a very high dimensional space, n1 times n2, etc. And for each of those u's, you would have to compute the, the number of crit real critical points of the u. Whereas if you want to compute it using this formula, you only need to, uh, to sample sort of relatively small matrices C and compute their, their determinants, which is, which is much faster than, than the other original thing. Okay, so here's the structure of C. It's, it's a symmetric matrix, first of all, and it has blocks that are size ni minus one times nj minus one, and so they, they are Cij's, and on the diagonals we have scalar multiples of the identity matrices, so with a fixed scalar W0. And in this, uh, so this is a random matrix, so the entries are random numbers, and in fact, they're all independent and, um, and uh, distributed uh, according to the standard Gaussian distribution. Okay? 
So let's do a sanity check that this is what, uh, what it should be according to, to the eckhart Young theorem for, for matrices. And in fact, yesterday on the plane I was even lazier. I didn't do the general matrix case, but, uh, but uh, two by two matrix case. Then this matrix C looks like this. It's uh, W0, W12, W12, W0. And the absolute value of the determinant is just this expression. And what's important about this expression, and also in the case, in the general matrix cases, that it's easy to see when it is positive or negative. It factorizes. Um, so that this, this expectation that you have here, which is some, you know, some integral, it's easy to split into parts where, where, the, where the sign of the determinant is definite. <coughs> and uh, so you can compute this expected value. It's 4 over pi. And then plugging that in the formula of the previous slide, you get 2 pi to the power um, 1 divided by 2 squared times 1. This is for the gammas times 4 over pi, which is 2. OK? OK. Now, I'd like to compare this to the, to the corresponding count of the complex numbers. And for that, I'd like to say something more general about what we call the Euclidean distance degree. So the, the more general stuff is in blue today, or sort of uh, dark cyan, cyan, according to my uh, pipe. Uh, so the more general problem is the following. You're given a real algebraic variety, x, in a Euclidean space. So we're a real vector space with a positive definite inner product. And you're given a point, and you'd like to say sufficiently general, and you'd like to count the critical points of the, of the, dist the squared distance function on the manifold of, of smooth points. So that's equivalent to, to counting the points x here where uh, u minus x is perpendicular to the, uh, to the tangent space 2x at x. And this means that locally uh, the distance to, to x uh, is either a minimum or a maximum, or at least it's a critical one. Um, OK, so now this is a difficult problem. One of the reasons being that it's not, uh, not well defined because that number of critical points is not fixed. So what we do is we, we is uh, uh, myself and Emil Horobetz and Ottaviani, Ben Stormfels and Reka Thomas, is to complexify this inner product to a symmetric bilinear form on the, on the corresponding complex vector space. So it's important here that this is a symmetric bilinear form and not a, not a Hermitian form. Um, so that means that, uh, that in particular this expression can be can be zero even if the vector in in between is not zero. Okay, so then uh, then if you do the corresponding count over the over the complex numbers, you find that if your v is sufficiently general, then the number of smooth points in the complexification of x, uh, for which u minus x is perpendicular to this tension space, is a, is some constant, and we call it the ed degree of of this. Uh, variety x or of, it, of its complexification. And uh, what we've been concerned with on the previous slide is the average ED degree, which is defined with respect to a probability measure on the, on the Euclidean space V. So it's the, it's the expected number of critical points for a random U in V. So this is a complex count and this is a, is a real count. OK, so let me tell you what the ED degree is for rank 1 tensors. Um, yeah, so now we complexify that in a product uh, that we had before to a symmetric bilinear form on this tensor product. And XC is now the, the, the smooth complex manifold of, of complex pure tensors. And then the theorem due to Schmuel Friedland and uh, Giorgio Ottaviani is that, uh, that the ED degree of X is the coefficient of this monomial, S1 to the n1 minus 1 times Sp to the np minus 1, in this polynomial. So this doesn't quite look like a polynomial, but it is. So here Si hat is just the sum of all S1 up to Sp except Si. And uh, it's clear that this uh, uh, numerator is divisible by this denominator. So 
this is a polynomial, and in that polynomial you take this, the coefficient of this thing. In particular, that's a, that's a positive number, and um, uh, that's what it is. Okay, so let's do the same kind of sanity check that we did, uh, did for the average case. Uh, here we should get two again for the same reason as in the previous case. Uh, I mean, we, we should get n, the minimum of n1 and n2, I should say. Okay, so p is 2, n1 is at most n2, and then this expression says, well, you take the coefficient of this in this expression, and then there's, there are some heads missing here, I'm sorry. Uh, this, oh no, 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 I repeat it. I replaced the things with the heads already by the, so as one head would be as two and as two head would be as one. So that's this expression here. And now if you expand that, you get the sum of these monomials and the sum of these monomials. And now if you want to get the coefficient of S1 to the N1 minus one times S2 to the N2 minus one, you see it appears as the product of this guy and this guy and also as the product of the previous guy and the previous guy here, etc. And you can keep on going until the minimum of, uh, S1, uh, of N1 and N2, which is N1, because that's what we assume. Okay? Okay, so now, the, in the rest of this talk, I'd like to give some, some of the main ideas that go into proving this statement and the, the previous statement. And one of the... Um, uh, one of the common denominators, or the, maybe the common denominator, is, the, is something that I'll discuss on the next slide. Okay. Um, so before, before going into that, let me describe some numbers. Let me give some numbers. So here, um, here are some tensor formats. Here are ED degrees, uh, according to the formula due to, due to Friedland and Ottaviani. And here are, say, our numbers. Um, so, for instance, if you, if you take 2 to some high power, then, uh, then that matrix C that I described looks like this. So, it's just uh, W0, W0. So, it's just, a, roughly speaking, a standard uh, random symmetric matrix with Gaussian entries, except that the diagonal is constant and that it is scaled such that it is n01 and not n02 or square root 2 or 1 over square root 2 or 1 over 2, whichever is the one that, that usually uh, people in random matrices look at. Um, nevertheless, it should be possible to, to compare these, say, uh, these numbers as p growth to, to the asymptotic behavior of the determinant of a, of a standard uh, a matrix C in the standard Gaussian ensemble. So, so here you get P factorial, and here you get something that grows slightly uh, slower. So here it gets multiplied with roughly 3, roughly 3, a bit more than 3, a bit more than 3, roughly 4. But, but we don't know uh, the, the exact asymptotics for this either yet. Now there's another intriguing phenomenon, um, which is a theorem over the complex numbers and so far just experimental over the real numbers, which is that, uh, that if, you, um, if you fix the last, um, say the largest uh, ni, let's call that, the, let's take the last one to be np, and if you take that such that np minus one is at least the sum for i is 1 up to p minus 1 of n i minus 1, then the ed degree of the complex numbers doesn't change anymore. So you see that happening here. 3 minus 1 is 2 is at least 1 plus 1. So from that point on, if you increase the last one, uh, this count doesn't, doesn't change anymore. Um, so I'd like to stress here that this is, you would expect such behavior when, uh, when NP is, say, at least the, the product of the N1 up to NP, or then it's very easy to prove. But, but that, that stabilization already happens at this point. And that's a theorem uh, which follows from the formula in the complex case, but there's no known geometric proof for that theorem. 
So there's no sort of bijective proof that shows that these numbers are the same. And if you do the corresponding computation over the real numbers, then, then you see something uh, even maybe funnier, which is that this number seems to slightly decrease rather than, than stabilize. We've run these computations quite often, so I'm fairly certain that this is not just numerical errors and that it, that it should really uh, stabilize, but, but that it's really slightly decreasing. What's, this, what's the difference between the red and the black? So the only thing is that the red illustrates this stabilization oh. behavior that, uh, that I'm just describing. Otherwise, there's no difference. So it happens over here and also over here. Okay. So that, uh, that common denominator in the two proofs is, is what we call, in general, so in blue, the uh, ED correspondence. So we're back in the general setting where we have some real algebraic variety X. And we, uh, we look at e of, curly E of X, which is the set of all pairs X comma U, where X is critical for DU. So in other words, U minus X is perpendicular to the tangent space. And, uh, well, that might not be a closed set, so we take the closure of that. Um, and this is something that you can do both over the real numbers and over the complex numbers. And, in fact, we'll use uh, both of these. So, so I'll use the same notation in both cases. Um, now, there's a, there are two observations. First of all, if you take the projection to V, then, then the fibers of that projection are exactly the things that, of which we want to ca count the ca cardinality. Because if you're given a U, you want to know how many X's there are for which this is critical. On the other hand, if you take the projection to X, then this is an affine vector bundle of, uh, of rank, uh, the co-dimension of X. And why that is, is fairly obvious from a picture. Because if you say, uh, say for later purposes, let me draw my x like this. So if I take, so this is some uh, some cone like this. So if I take an x here, then uh, then what are the u's for which it is critical? Well, they are just the ones on the normal uh, to the variety x uh, through the point x. Yeah, so this is a straight angle here. Yeah. So that's an affine uh, vector space whose dimension is, has complementary dimension to the dimension of x itself. Um, OK, so that's, uh, that's the uh, ED correspondence. And now sometimes, if, if x is like in this picture a cone, which means that it is cl closed under scalar multiplication, then, uh, then it's more convenient to work with the projective variety. So px is the projective variety in pv. And you can take the image of P e x in p x times v, um, and then what happens is that uh, if you take this point x over here, or you take a scalar multiple of it, then uh, then these two uh, affine vector spaces are the same, except that they are, have been uh, translated a little bit. So that means that if if you take the uh, fiber over a projective point, uh, x with, um, with square brackets, you're going to get an entire uh, plane like this in this picture. So you're going to get something which is, uh, which is spanned by the orthogonal complement of the tangent space plus x. And this is a direct sum provided that x is not perpendicular to itself. Yeah, if x were perpendicular to itself, then then this would already be contained in this. Now, if you're working over the real numbers, uh, there are no points that are perpendicular to themselves, so then it's always really this. But if you work over the complex numbers, you have to worry about, uh, about these points that are, that are perpendicular to themselves. OK, so the conclusion of this is that the projective ED correspondence is, also a, is now not an affine vector bundle, but really a vector bundle over over the real, uh, over the, the regular locus of this projective variety um, of rank, the co-dimension of x plus 1 because of this uh, business over here, at least if you stay away from the set of points that are perpendicular to themselves. Now, uh, to give an idea about the proof of the Friedland-Ottaviani formula, 
we need some notions, some, some notions having to do with vector bundles. Yeah, we, we have a vector bundle, EX, uh, or PEX, and um, now if you're given a, a data point V, then you can think of that as a section of the, of the trivial bundle, namely uh, the, the, the section that assigns to every point in X that data point U. Yeah, so this gives, uh, say, the constant function from PX to V that assigns to any point V. Um, and you can take the quotient of this trivial bundle by the, by the vector bundle that we have over here. And roughly speaking, the ED degree counts the zeros of this section. Of this section. But again, you have to be careful uh, at Q, and you have to be careful at. Can you go back this slide? Yeah. So, EX is the incidence curves from it? Yes, that's right. Okay. And then, okay, now to your next slide. So, so maybe you maybe you don't like this notation, but but so. I, 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 it's your talk. You can use the notation. I just want okay. to understand it, and sure. I got it now. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Good. I wanted to avoid O's and uh, blah, blah, yeah, and, okay. Good. Now, uh, w w whenever you have a vector bundle whose rank is equal to the dimension of the, uh, of the projective variety, uh, which, which this uh, vector bundle has, because, uh, because this one had uh, rank... Uh, I, I was confused by your use of, use of E for two different things on the slide. Some that's right, yeah. Maybe this E is the quotient over here. Yeah. yeah that's right. So if you have a general vector bundle uh, whose rank is equal to the dimension of your, of your uh, projective variety, and there are technical conditions such, that, such as that your vector bundle should, uh, should locally generate, uh, should be, um, what's the word, uh, should be globally generated, um, then, then the, the zeros of such a general section are counted by the degree of the top churn class of that vector bundle. And this is something that lives in the Chow ring of, or the cohomology ring, if you want, of the projective variety Px. So roughly speaking, if you, if you understand that Chow ring and if you understand the behavior at singular points and, and at Q, then, then you can maybe say something about the ED degree. Now back to our setting, X is, a pure, is the variety of pure tensors, so PX is just uh, the segre embedding of, of a product of projective spaces. So that's a smooth variety of which we know the Chow ring very well. It's just uh, the, uh, the, the polynomial ring over the integers in S1 up to SP modulo the ideal generated by these uh, expressions over here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's quickly give, uh, give a if, give an idea of the proof of that formula. So here's the formula again. Um, obviously, we're going to need the tangent space. So what's the tangent space to the variety X at a pure tensor of this? Well, you get it by, by just varying, uh, by the Leibniz rule, basically. You're, you're, you're going to get it by varying for each j running from 1 to p. The, the jth vector, so it's the sum over j's one up to p of such a product, where only the jth vector is a is an entire vector space. This is not a direct sum because because all of them intersect in in the original uh, vector v1 tensor up to vp. Okay, so now uh, here we go. Remember, we wanted to count for a general point u the number of uh, X such that this lies in the projective ED correspondence. Now this is equivalent to saying that there exists a C such that U minus C times X is perpendicular to the tension space, which is uh, this expression. And um, now if we assume that X is good, so that it's not perpendicular to it itself, then you can write this space <coughs> as a direct sum of X itself and the corresponding space, but, but with VI, capital VI, replaced by the orthogonal complement of, uh, of VI. <coughs> so let's do that and let's assume this. So then this is the same thing as there exists a C such as for all I, that's the same. And then 
two things must hold, namely u minus cx must be perpendicular to x, and u must be perpendicular to this, because x itself is already perpendicular to this. Now, uh, this c doesn't uh, appear here anymore, it appears only here, and by cho cho choosing that c, we can always achieve this, because, again, x is not perpendicular to itself. So this is the same thing as saying that u is perpendicular to this uh, tensor product. So now if you take, if you define another vector bundle, which is somewhat close to the project, projective, to, to the quotient of the trivial bundle by the projective ED correspondence, but not quite it, because this is something that is defined also at, uh, at points that are, uh, that are perpendicular to themselves. So if you, if you t take EI to be the bundle of, uh, on PX, where the fiber over X is this vector space, so it's roughly this vector space, but you take the dual, then you can think of a tensor as giving a section on each of these uh, EIs, and hence uh, a section of the, of the direct sum of these EIs, namely that U gives, by taking inner products, that, that U is going to give a, a linear form on this uh, space over here, so hence an element of this dual space. Um, and the, uh, the zeros of that section are exactly the axes that we're trying to count. And now I'm sweeping under the rug this business about Q. Now the Turing class of this vector bundle is exactly this coefficient over here. So this is a direct sum of, of vector bundles uh, that translates into a, uh, to a product of the corresponding Turing classes. Okay. okay, so that's that formula. Now the other formula also uses the uh, ED correspondence or the incidence correspondence. Um, so how does it work? Well, there's a very sort of naive double counting argument. Oh, this is not what I wanted. Um, so imagine that that ED correspondence looks somewhat like this. Then, uh, so, so what you're trying to compute is some weighted average of uh, one, which is the, the, the number of uh, the size of the fiber here, and three, which is the size of the fiber here, and one, which is the size of the fiber here. Then what you can do if your probability distribution here is given by a density function or by a volume form, then you can pull back that volume form to, uh, to, to this ED correspondence and compute the integral here rather than down here. And now, uh, so I call this double counting because given you know, given u, it is difficult to compute the x's, but given x, it's easy to compute the u's. Um, so, so we're trying to, we're going to compute the integral over that ED correspondence, and this is the formula that you get. So the integral over v of these fiber sizes times the density du, this is just uh, the back measure, uh, is the integral. Oh, there, there's one more step here, which is that if you also have a nice parameterization from r to the right dimension to, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the ED correspondence, then, uh, then you can pull back this, this uh, computation of the integral on this to, to, the, to, to r to that dimension, r1 in this case. So what you're going to get is that this expression that you want to compute is the integral over r to the dimension of the Jacobian of pi composed with phi, sorry, this, this should be a phi over here, um, at t times the density evaluated at pi 2 phi of t dt. Now if your x happens to be a rational variety then you can take uh, then you can not only parameterize x by rationally but also the uh, the ED correspondence, or even the projective ED correspondence, if, that, if that's more convenient. Okay, so, uh, so here's how that works. Uh, some details, namely you fix some norm 1 vectors, EI and VI, and you let W be 
the orthogonal complement of the direct sum, now it's a direct sum of E1 tensor, tensor EI orthogonal complement up to AP, and this is the fiber over this projective point in this projective ED correspondence. Um, and the, the birational map from, by means of which I parameterize this, this projective variety is just the map that, uh, that takes a tuple of vectors, V1 up to Vp, in the orthogonal complements here, and takes their tensor product after adding them to, uh, to Ei. Yeah, that's a birational map from, from this vector space to this uh, projective variety. And uh, now, uh, um, if you would like to know the fiber over, over this point rather than this original point, then you just take the fiber W and you hit it with a product of, I mean, a tuple of orthogonal maps where, uh, where the ith orthogonal map is such that it maps EI into the corresponding thing here, namely EI plus VI. Um, strictly speaking, I mean the projective point EI into this projective point. Now, there are many such maps, but, uh, but one such choice is this expression over here. So, uh, this is just a projection to the orthogonal complement of EI and VI. Um, so, in other words, GI is going to be the identity on that orthogonal complement, and this is the, 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 the matrix of determinant 1 that maps EI to, uh, uh, to, to EI plus VI, and that is orthogonal. And uh, so now what's important about this expression is that the choice, of course, depends on, on the numbers V1 up to Vp. So now we get a parameterization of this projective ED correspondence that takes V1 up to Vp into, um, this should have been a, sorry, I mixed up letters. This should have been a phi and this should have been a psi of V1 up to Vp and then G applied to W. And there's an implicit in dependence on V1 up to Vp here because G itself depends on V1 up to Vp. So you, you do this computation that I, that I wrote down uh, for this particular case and you note that, that this Jacobian matrix has a very large block which is just the identity matrix uh, and that accounts for the, 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 for the reduction in dimension that I stressed at the beginning. So, uh, so this determinant over here is a, you need to compute only a determinant of a very small uh, sub-matrix of that Jacob. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a rough sketch of how to prove that formula. Um, now I'll be rather brief about this. You can also do things over the, for symmetric tensors. There you equip the space of the pth symmetric power of Rn with the positive n product that satisfies this rule. Sometimes it's called the Bombieri inner product. Um, and now you want to approximate a tensor U by an element of X, which is the set of all plus or minus V to the power P, where V runs through this set. Uh, this plus or minus is necessarily only when P is an even number. And uh, again, if you draw U from the uniform distribution on, on the unit sphere, then you can compute the expected number of critical points, and now, in fact, the dimension it, uh, goes down all the way up to n, uh, that's right, all the, way, all the way down up to n. So p plays a role in this formula only through its occurrence in the arguments of this integral. So it's an uh, integral, there are some familiar th uh, gammas, and there are no pi's here, but they are sort of hidden, uh, and there's an integral over sort of eigenvalues of something, lambda 2 up to lambda n, which should be ordered, and then there's this product, etc., etc. And, uh, and when, uh, when p is equal to 2, you can compute this, and it is what it should be, namely n. But it turns out that, in fact, also... Uh, what's my point? Uh, that, uh, that for fixed, certain fixed values of n, there are also nice, nice formulas. So for, for n is equal to 2, so this is rational normal curves if you want. You get average ED degrees that are 1, 2, square root 7, square root 10, square root 13, etc. And for, for n equal to 3, you're going to get numbers 1, 3, and then some, 
some more complicated expressions. And we don't really know, we, we haven't been able to extrapolate these formulas into the rest of this thing. But it's conceivable that there's a, that there's a closed form formula in general. Now on the left are the ED degrees over the complex numbers, and they had been known already before uh, Friedland and Ottaviani's work. Very basic. Yep. Is it obvious that these are algebraic numbers? True. Uh, that's a good question, I don't know. It's, it's certainly not obvious. It's true uh, here, you but believe uh, it's true always. I, I don't. so uh, I discussed this with people doing integrals, and but they they didn't <coughs> they didn't care about algebraic numbers, so they did, they, couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't give me any hint. But, yeah. That would be a first step towards finding a closed form solution, <laughs> <laughs> proving that they're algebraic. Um, okay, so uh, there's a theorem due to <laughs> Dustin Cartwright and Bernd Stormfels, which gives the ED degree in this case. Okay, so here's a, here are some uh, last further remarks. Uh, I didn't ex make this explicit, but uh, I mentioned that for matrices, these, uh, there's a singular value decomposition, and uh, McHang has work on sort of singular values for arbitrary tensors, and they are exactly these... So these critical uh, rank one approximations to, to, to a tensor. And in the symmetric case, they are these things that are counted by this formula are the eigenvectors of, uh, of a symmetric tensor. Now, if you change inner products on V, then uh, if you do it sort of uh, continuously, then your average count is going to change continuously, but your, your complex count is going to jump. And we know, we know sort of the g generic uh, formula. So there's a very nice theorem in our paper that I'll mention later that, that deals with, with uh, toric varieties. So for toric varieties and sort of general uh, inner products, there's, there's, there's a formula, a combinatorial formula for the ED degree. Now the closed form expression we discussed already a little bit. I think it should be possible using these methods to also study the number of local minima rather than just all critical points. Here's a very annoying thing. I do not even know the, uh, the hypersurface in the 2x2x2 two by two by two case where this, uh, where, where, this cut, where this thing jumps, this fiber. I know that all three possible values, 2, 4, and 6, occur, but I, I don't know what the hypersurface is. Uh, it might be nice in general to know what are all the typical values, so the ones that are attained in open sets. I mean, right now, hypersurface has to come from trivial representation of the orthogonal group. That's right. Yes, yes. So, 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 so it's very so, so, in part, so in particular, it's probably list of not. Candidates, right? Yeah. Well, I, 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 if you, if you fix the degree, degree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's uh, but uh, we don't. I guess we don't know the degree, right? In this case. <laughs> No, it's maybe for certain generic choices, of course. So I mentioned this stabilization issue. I think this is a very nice geometric question. Uh, give a proof of that. Now, this is a sort of uh, speculative. I don't have anything sensible to say about how the knowledge of these uh, ED degrees can be used in, in finding uh, best approximations. And But then the last thing is uh, rank two. I think in general, uh, for general rank, things will be extremely difficult, but rank two should be something where maybe both of the two computations should be doable. Uh, okay, here are some references, and uh, thank you. Questions for Jan? Yes. Uh, so, you can compute the best rank one approximation also by uh, uh, maximizing you know, the function associated to the tensor on the unit rate sphere or the product. Yeah, yeah. So these critical points for the function are related to the critical points you compute here. Yeah, I think they're exactly the same. I, yeah. Sorry, maybe, maybe I don't. Uh, I think they're exactly the same thing. And uh, actually, uh, about the algorithms, so one thing that people do in the ca case, of, I, in the case of ordinary tensors, is that. You fix. You, you start with some guess, 
and then you fix all but all, say p minus one of the factors and then you optimize in the in the remaining factor and you repeat this for you know all possible choices and uh, but it is not clear that that should always I think it's known that that does not always converge to the global optimum. Let me ask a wild question. This is very wild. <coughs> what about non-negative rank? Um, some of the techniques, some of the techniques might work. The parameterization at least give you a setting to which are integrals to do. Yeah. Yeah. If you. I, I, I mean, we use a parameterization, so, so I think, I mean, writing down something should be easy, but uh, then actually finding a nice expression for those integrals should be difficult. Or might be difficult. Yeah, there's a question. When you said rank, do you mean bottle rank, or is it really rank? Rank two? Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, I guess I mean really rank two over the real number. I, you, you're wondering about this business, right? So of the real numbers, I would, I, I think I would like to start really with a parameterization uh, and 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 do rank. But over the complex numbers, it doesn't really matter because I mean the the, the rank two things are dense in the border rank two things. So. Any other questions for a speaker? If not, let's thank Jan again for a while.